I'm interviewing David McGrogan, also Noisms, also Monsters Manuals, about his new Kickstarter in the halls in the hall of the third blue wizard, which is a, a new Kickstarter zine he's bringing out hopefully soon. Well, it's funded, so he will be bringing it out. Hello, David. Yeah. How are you? Hello, Patrick. Um, I'm feeling old. We were just yeah. saying, weren't we? Just discussing. We're both, we're both almost exactly the same age, I think. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm about a week older than you. Yeah, like so we yeah. should be 40 now. So we're definitely into yeah. like the grumbling, weird grognard stage. And uh, I yeah. think I've been doing this for about blogging for just over 10 years. So I've gone from 30, which is nearly excusably young, almost, mm. to definitely more <laughs> on the borders of all <laughs> And we both look at and sound it. Like, yeah, we do. <laughs> I was still talking to another friend about this the other day on WhatsApp. Like, I used to... Um, I can remember a time when I used to watch Friends and mm-hmm. think to myself, oh, they're like older than I am. And then, like, it fast forwarded to, I was the same age as the people in Friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, started, I was, like, watching Seinfeld and thinking, yeah, well, I'm not quite as old as the people in Seinfeld, but, like, then I was the same age as them. And I've recently, for some reason, I just started re-watching Frasier from the start, like, from the first episode. <laughs> and in the first episode of Frasier, he's, uh, he's 40 or 41, so he's, like, the, like the same age as Frasier. Oh, damn. That's how, um, that's how I sort of judge, like, the milestones in my life. I'm an old you man. Look, you look good, uh, I, Ben, that's a good place to start. So, yeah. talking of age, we've yeah. both been around for a while. This is a difficult mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. What's your favourite death of the OSR? What's my favourite? Death of the OSR, considering the fact that it dies. Uh, right, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it dies death. like on a yearly basis. It's been declared it? dead for a million times. <laughs> Do any, does any particular one stick out in your mind? Um, I think... I, I want to say, I, I say Dwimmer Mount, only because I've recently been thinking about Dwimmer Mount. <laughs> Do you remember that one? I think that might have been like the first sort of death of the OSR. Yeah, I thought wasn't that one. Days, isn't it? Who's the Grognardia guy? Malazewski. James Malashevsky, yeah. yeah. And um, he, it just nearly, it might took him off the internet for like, how long? Five years? It did, yeah. Well, even longer, I think. Yeah, it was a long time anyway, wasn't it? Because his blog was like the main one, wasn't it, back at the start? I mean, I don't think that's an exaggeration to say like it was like... We all have different thoughts, but he definitely feels like at the being there at the beginning of the blog's put era, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He is for, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And the people used to go there and he used to update like two or three times a day, didn't he? It was just like relentless. Yeah. Um, but then, he, and he had this Kickstarter that generated like... Mm-hmm. I think it's like forty thousand dollars or something, or forty-five thousand dollars. Big money in the early days of Kickstarter. But still, <laughs> it's big money now. <laughs> not really, not anymore. But we'll go well, on. No, yeah, I suppose it's not. Like, yeah, there are. Yeah, but it's big money in comparison to like what I can. Uh, <laughs> and me, I can sum it up in my uh, <laughs> with my meager uh, Kickstarter. Um, and yeah, and it all failed and collapsed, didn't it? And then it was sort of like it was almost as though. Um, someone had like kicked away the the main like what do you call it like you know like in a in a marquee tent it's like a big tent pole in the middle is there a special name for that is it just called a tent pole i think it's just called a tent pole well it was like someone kicked it away anyway and it all just like collapsed it was sort of um it was almost as though there was this like incipient sort of um mini industry developing and then it was just like its main like flagship was sunk to use a different metaphor wasn't it um yeah. so that was like an original because that must have been about 2010 i want to say was 2011 maybe i don't know 2008 was when the osr really took off maybe it's about 2010 something like that maybe a bit later you've just triggered um the guys from where the hell is that that forum that everyone talks about Oh, Dragon's Foot. Yeah. Or Knights and Knaves, Alehouse. Could be that. Knights and Knaves, Alehouse. Yeah. <laughs> Where Johnny come lately is compared to them. Yeah, I know. Well, they, they, for them, like, there is no old school renaissance, right? It's like it, yeah. they've just been it's going. The whole time. Yeah. <laughs> they've just been continuing. They've just been, like, nursing this, like, little flame and keeping it alive um, mm-hmm. for 30 years. Yeah. Although, I mean, the... the the OSR itself is now like 15 years old, isn't it? So um, that's quite scary to think that um, 
I've basically been doing this hobby for probably longer than I've ever stuck at anything else. <laughs> like doing my blog. <laughs> 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 like I've had other hobbies, like other interests and stuff, but this right. is probably like the longest lived sort of project that I've ever done. If you if you think about my blog as like one one single project. So here, leading on to another question, mm. why do you think it won't just won't die completely and why it keeps reanimating and somehow surviving in some form? Why do you think that is? I think it's a mm, it's a combination of two I think it's a combination of sheer like bloody mindedness on the part of some of the people involved. So I think you're probably in that category as well, aren't you? Like there's no reason why you would stop blogging now, is there really? No, well, I've got nothing else to do. I mean, there's no, <laughs> nothing I've been meaningfully successful at in my entire life. It's this or the call center. So no, I would stop blogging. Although well, it's been hard to keep up saying anything interesting or useful or simultaneously working yeah, on yeah. stuff. Yeah, I it mean, is. But like anime or films I've seen and stuff. But I, reading back to my blog, I used to dump like serious, around 2015, I was dropping like serious chunks of law and ideas and it's like i hope you have been quite that good ever since yeah at least that, not... that like the peak yeah you feel like it's been downhill since about 2015. <laughs> i mean i've been doing other things i have released books and things so it's not like the the creative energy's been going nowhere but it, it does get challenging to blog and uh do this and publish at the same time and write yeah. but i mean the death of google plus did um well, you uh, well, to sort of like tie this back to the death of the OSR. I do think the death of G plus did take some of the wind out of the sails of everything, didn't it? Because I felt oh. like when in like the height of the heyday of G plus, I felt like there was quite a good, um, like a, a, a very sort of like benevolently competitive atmosphere where people were trying to like, as well as getting ideas off each other, they were also trying to like do better than each other, weren't they? In a nice way. I don't mean in a kind of, um, though well, it wasn't always nice, that's for sure, but mm. um, <laughs> but in a in a kind of, um, in a friendly competitive sort of a way. I think people kind of pushed each other on. There was a bit of peer pressure to like, just do really cool creative things. And I feel like that's gone out of, that's gone out of like the OSR, hasn't it? Um, I wouldn't know because I've been in like psychological retreat for the last like two or three years and just like withdrawing from forums and just basically just blogging. So I'm I now know less than I ever would have about the the culture at large, and I'm relatively happy in that way. Yeah, there's nowhere I really want to be. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, but a lot the... of stuff started changing around 2015. Google Plus was a massive thing, but also pretty much the entirety of culture seems to have tilted a lot since mm. then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the internet's got a lot more like um, sort of aggro since then, hasn't it? And and really crazy. Mm -hmm. I think sort of twenty fifteen was maybe almost like the kind of the last, the last gasp of sort of like the old internet, like the ninety late nineties kind of internet, where yeah. people were still um, like positive, and it was like, oh yeah, I can like I can chat to people in Albania or right. <laughs> it was kind of like. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was the, it was possible still to kind of vaguely think of the internet in those terms in 2015, where as now it's just not. Now it's just like, <laughs> are we really sure that this invention was a very good idea? Maybe we should just cancel the whole thing. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, speaking but, of that, and in a more positive thing, I'll I'll loop to what was going to be the end of my interview, and then we can go back and forth. Hmm. You're making a thing called. The holes of the third blue wizard. I'm assuming it's the um, a reference to Tolkien because there were meant to be two blue wizards there. I think. Yeah, that was the idea. Yeah, it's like yeah, exactly. It's it's nothing uh, particularly like deep or meaningful. It was just I was thinking about the two blue wizards, and then for some reason it popped into my head. Yeah, a third blue wizard, right, the third so unmentioned blue wizard. What void in culture are you trying to repair with this? Um. I'm trying. Uh, well, that's a good question, actually. I think partly it's trying to try to recapture a little bit of that um, early um, OSR sort of vibe, where people were just were like creating things, um, but also, I think we've got into slightly. Well, I think I don't know. I don't know if Kickstarter. I mean, it's, it's very 
it, it, it's kind of hypocritical to say this about Kickstarters when I'm just in the middle of like running a Kickstarter, but um, I, I feel like some Kickstarter it, it might have a tendency towards like frothiness. I wouldn't say this by, for any means about like all Kickstarters, but like some of them have a tendency to, um, um, I'm thinking of like, the, you know, like the Avatar one, mm -hmm. where it just almost seems like um, people are just getting carried away and there's a bandwagon forming. Um, and I'm not really sure if the substance of the game merits it. Not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with it, but you know, you know what I mean. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying there seems to be quite a lot of hype. It's, it's a lot of hype, and I thought it would be quite nice to just maybe go back to basics and have a magazine that, like an old-fashioned magazine, where people just tr submit things, and there's an editor who says, "Yeah, I like that. Um, I'll include it in the zine," or "I don't and I won't," and he gives money and he, you know, gives money to people who, and buys their submissions off them, buys the rights to their submissions if he likes them. Um, it quite might be nice to go back to that kind of a model. So and will thought, it be an actual magazine or will it be a book? Yeah, it's an actual, well, yeah, well, it's kind of like, yeah, like, a, it's like, I suppose it's like a thick zine. Mm -hmm. It'll be like 55,000 words, so it's quite a lot. And but why think, did sorry. you go with B5 for a format? Because that's a hell of a strange format to put anything in. <laughs> well, it was. it's not quite B5, it's like slightly smaller. It's like a few uh -huh. millimetres smaller. Because the guy at the publisher uh, said, like, that's a very economical um, <laughs> format. <laughs> Nothing really more complicated than that. Although um, I quite like B5. It's, it's sort of, I think, I don't like, I don't like using A formats because it sort of feels like an exercise book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're using A4 or A5. Yeah. This is so familiar. It might, it might be different to American audiences with, like, because um, they have letter sized and they letter sized. I have um, restrictions with that size in the past, but yeah, it's so it's um if you're not aware of it, if you're moving between different times of publishing, then if you don't realise you're going from letter size to A4 back and forth, mm. it's like a, a nightmarish trap because they're so subtly different. You basically have to reform <laughs> everything, but for that tiny difference, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you don't end up squashed or stretched out. It's yeah, yeah. agonising. But I, yeah. it's, so when people pick up in the holes of the third blue wizard, what are they going to get? What will them? Um, yeah. Sell well, me on this, David. Sell me on it. Well, they're going to get. Um, well, actually, no, that's a good question. I, do you know what I should have done in preparation, but didn't do? Was counted how many submissions there are. So let's let's uh, <laughs> count how many things it's got in it. It's got art. It's got um, short stories, and it's got um, sort of like gaming content. So it's got some like dungeons. It's got some hex maps. It's got. Uh, I will give you the. I'll give you the number. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. At least 12 articles slash items. I think more than that, though. I think probably more like 15. Mm. Of which most of it is stuff that you can use in your OSR slash OSE game. And bits of it are short fiction. I think there's um, short stories wise, I think there are one, two, three short stories, possibly four, three or four. And that was the other thing that I wanted to fill, uh, just going back to the gap that I'm filling in the market, hopefully. I thought it'd be quite cool. It would be good to have like a short fiction bit of the zine, because I think like there is quite a lot of, um, well, as I've learned, actually, there's quite a lot of uh, sort of frustrated creative writing talent out there in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know, like if I was going to, if I was like an aspiring short story writer, have you read uh, Stephen King on writing? I have not, sadly. But it's, it's good. It. It's, it's it's a good book. But um, so I because I, I, I think when I was like younger, I had like plans of being a writer when I was like you know a teenager. Yes, so I used yep. to get these books, books on like how to make it in publishing and stuff, and they would always say similar things, which was like start off like writing short stories and sell them, and then like. You know, if you if you publish enough short stories, eventually you'll be able to get. You can approach an agent, and you'll be able to say, "Look, you know, I've got this. I've got potential. Like, I can, um, you know, I can publish short fiction and get it sold, and people will read it. So maybe that way you can then get a deal for a novel or something." Mm -hmm. um, 
but I feel like now that route, like if I was an aspiring novelist, which I'm not really anymore, but if I was, and I was trying to follow that advice, I would be thinking like, where the fuck can I submit it's like short stories <laughs> with like five? Um, where could I do that? Um, so I thought, well, it'd be quite good to actually have like one of those avenues, wouldn't it? It'd be quite good to start one off. And so there, have been, there have been zines in the other side before, like there's been Knock Spell, I think it's been a few others, yeah. right? Yeah. So has... what's if you what what's the difference between yours and and uh, those? I think uh, well, I think I I I don't want to uh, speak out of turn, but I think I'm right in saying Knock Spell. Uh, the the one that the one that's actually the better comparison probably is Knock. Ah, uh, right. Do you know Knock? Yes, I have the first issue of it, but I didn't get the rest. Uh, I think yeah. it has Bill Arnold stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I really like Knock, and I've been I've had stuff in um, issue two and issue three of Knock. So I'm not knocking Knock, <laughs> no pun intended. But um, I, I think that, that, so that kind of zine, so the idea was either that you, you're getting, a, like, um, already published stuff and gathering it together, mm-hmm. or you're just get, people are contributing to a zine and then you're doing a Kickstarter and people get a cut of the money at the end. Mm-hmm. So what I wanted to do was have like a, a more old school, old school um, publishing model where people would submit things and they'd just be paid by the word. So I, I had like an initial um, sort of pot of money, like seed money, if you like that is going to be paid to contributors come what may, whether, whether the Kickstarter succeeded or not. Mm-hmm. They, uh, you know, I'm, I'm buying the rights to their stories for a certain price or buying the right to their art or buying the right to their gaming material for a certain price. They're going to get that money regardless. The idea being, you know, um, well, hopefully this can become like an actual long-lasting zine, maybe like once or twice a year it'll get produced and people will just be submitting stuff to me all the time. And if I like what they submit, then I'll buy it. If I don't, then I won't, you know, and I'll just kind of like put out a, an issue of the zine every, whenever, you know, whenever it is, like every six months or, or whatever it might be. So kind of, um, yeah, almost like launching a more traditional magazine, I suppose, you know, just what a magazine would do in the old sort of magazine industry. But at the same time, you know, I'm not, um, although I had some money that I thought I could invest in it, it's also nice to have, well, to not have to spend loads of money. <laughs> and that's right. why I think Kickstarter, with my, you know, I'll try Kickstarter at first as well to get like, you know, to recover my own money that I've sunk into it. And maybe make a bit of profit that can be kind of like pumped back into the, into the zine. All right. Creatively, what would, if you can, could think of a way to describe it, what would you say its tone was? Like its imaginative tone? Um, I think it's go like, on. Go ahead. Sorry, say again. Uh, is there anything you can think of that it's like that you would use as a comparison? Um, I think it's a lot more... I don't know if this is just because of, like, who reads my blog these days. I think probably now, like, I've reached the point where um, I've got, like, a, an audience of readers for my blog, um, and they're probably the people who've been submitting stuff to the zine. So I think it's quite... It has a certain tone that's probably quite um monsters and manuals y in the sense that it's a little bit <laughs> it's a little bit like pseudo intellectual. <laughs> it's a nice. little bit um I think it's not it's not like grimdark. I think that's uh, I, I was quite pleased that the submissions weren't really very they're a little bit more um upbeat or frivolous is the wrong word. I don't mean frivolous. I mean kind of um a bit lighter in tone than like Lamentations stuff, for example, would be. There seems to be a bit of a fairy tale tinge. Yeah, to... exactly. Yeah, there is a t- yeah. Uh, I'd say not exactly fairy tale, maybe, but kind of like dreamy. Mm. Like I think um, almost like slightly surrealist kind of um, feel to some of it. I think it's a, it's a, a bit more like um, if I was thinking of like a, a fantasy author whose work it would resemble. I would, I suppose, I would think more like, um, like um, almost like I, I don't like Lovecraft's Dreamlands, but almost slightly Dreamlandsy. Hmm. That's kind of what it feels a bit, a bit like to me. Um, maybe slightly like Gene Wolfian as well. Like Gene Wolf has all these like kind of um, 
you know, he has all these kind of like dream episodes in his fiction. So I, I feel like it, it's a little bit like that as well. Yeah, maybe slightly, um, slightly whimsical even. I don't like the use of the word whimsical either. But um, yeah, maybe leaning towards that. So you you won't find like um, tortured, mutilated corpses and, um, you know, evil demons and stuff. Well, actually, you know, there are demons in it. <laughs> you would say civil demons rather than intact yeah, it's not like very kind of bloodthirsty body horror, like metal kind of like vibe at all. Not really like that. Um, but having said that, the uh, the fiction, um, one of the stories is quite, uh, um, one of the stories is quite funny. One of them is like deliberately a comedy. One of them is um, like very, um, oh, what's that book called? Little Big. Do you know Little Big? Yes, John Crowley. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never liked that book, but uh, I do, I do quite like. <laughs> I quite like the tone of it. I like yeah. the tone of it. Like, I like it in theory, but in practice, I don't like it. Do you know I what think I, mean? I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the um, the, the, but one of the stories is is like a good version of it of Little Big. Um, <laughs> <that's quite cool>. um <laughs> and one of them is um, one of them is like proper sort of dungeoneering fiction, like that. I want to sort of like champion the cause of like fantasy stories that are about like D and D esque scenarios. But... I've got one in there that's like that. I've got one in there that's like um imagine if Gene Wolf decided imagine if Gene Wolf played D and D and then like wrote a story about <laughs> <laughs> going into the dungeon. <laughs> that's what it's like. It's really good. I'm I'm, I'm pleased with, with like all the short fiction in there. I got so many submissions, short story submissions. Like I got literally like dozens and dozens of them. Um and it was really, really hard to, to choose some because there were some really good ones, but the, the some like well, for whatever reason they're slightly too long, so I couldn't include them, or um, they just didn't feel quite right tonally or whatever. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, but I'm really pleased with the, the the three or four that are in there. I think they're really good. They're like a good like spectrum of um, of content, if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, it's quite good. So you'll enjoy them if you if you get the zine. I guarantee you'll enjoy them. This is interesting too. It's a it's a monsters and manuals ish uh, magazine, basically. Yeah, but none of it's written by me, mm -hmm. unless the stretch goal gets fulfilled, in which case it will be something by me. Ah, the devil in the land of rushes. The devil in the land of the rushes. Yeah, which is a little hex map. Well, I say little, like a normal sized hex map, I suppose. Which was supposed to be in something you were going to contribute to. Oh yeah. That ended up being Silent Titans. Yes. <coughs> so kind of like theoretically, this thing is in the same game world as Silent Titans, but it's not. It's not really. It's um. It's its own thing. To give you a little hint, it's about um. Uh, the devil has for some reason decided that this certain area of land is um no longer going to have time. So he basically makes it one eternal eternal day that repeats itself endlessly. Mm -hmm. So it become, time becomes cyclical. Um, and so there's all these events that are supposed to happen tomorrow, but which never happen. So it's kind of like um, a hex map in which everything is like predicated on the next day arriving, but it never does. But then the PCs come and then maybe what they do instigate the next day coming. So maybe they can rewrite time. And then once that happens, a whole lot of events will unfold. So... Uh -huh. I don't know if it would actually be gameable <laughs> in reality because I never ran it and it just seemed like a fun idea um, that I was thinking about. But if anything else, at least it'll give you some, there'll be like monsters that you can rip off out of it <laughs> and random it's, encounters and stuff. Uh, that leads us up to Orbis. What, the name of, you have another thing. Yeah, you know, I do have another thing. <laughs> I've got loads of things. Non-moving world. So yeah, all this the time based thing, really, in a sense, because that's a world where it doesn't move and everywhere has one time of day. Is that right? Or time of year? Yeah, well, both. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So it's the, it's a world that's, I think I was imagining it to be flat mm -hmm. and it's underneath the sun. So wherever you are in the world, and it doesn't move, so the sun doesn't move. It's always fixed in a certain place. So wherever you are in the world, it's always the same time of day and always the same time of year right so if it's always it could be always dawn and always winter or 
you know, always noon and always summer or always evening and always autumn or, you know, any combination of those things. So there is one, there's one, the first chapter of that is out. You can buy it from my website, Noisms Games, Google it, um, <laughs> for a very reasonable price. But I'm just going to release them kind of like as and when. Now that you've mentioned it, I, I do seem to have an obsession with them. Um, days and times being like fixed or different because I had another idea as well that I never finished that I always kind of wanted to to see to fruition which is where the sun well the earth is moving around the sun but just really really slowly so a day lasts for a thousand years so you get this very slow so like um you know, over time, different parts of the world are warm for a very long time or cold for a very long time or light for a very long time or dark for a very long time. I did quite a few posts about that and people seem to like it, but then I'd never, uh, I could never think of a way to make it kind of like gameable. Um, but yeah, it, obviously Mobilis is, that's kind of like an ongoing concern. I'm just going to kind of put out stuff um, as and when I want to in regard to that. The next thing I want to make for that is probably... Um, Again, something I wrote about on my blog called the Bay of Sweetness, which is the part of the world where it's always winter, always noon. Um, so it's like always cold, but also always uh, daytime. Mm -hmm. um, and that I wrote some blog entries about that as well. Um, that was kind of, uh, yeah, that might be the next thing I put out. But there's also something else that's waiting, that's finished. Mm -hmm. There's wasting publication later on in the year. Uh, is, are you burying the lead or are you going to tell me what it is? <laughs> Which is the long awaited uh, by me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the long awaited uh, follow up to Yoon Suin, which is um, kind of a similar thing to Yoon Suin, but set in. Um, I don't know if I was imagining it as the same world or not, but like um, it's, it's the same kind of thing, like lots and lots and lots of tables to generate um, a setting. Mm -hmm. And the setting is um, like an alternate universe version of Northumberland. Oh, I think is this a version of what we're playing uh, on online? Um, I don't, not quite, but not oh. quite. But maybe it could be imagined again to be like in the same universe, I guess, the same world. <laughs> um, so it's um, it's um, all finished. It's it's written. Uh, it's written ages ago, actually. And there's a guy who's doing the art for it. I don't know if I'm at liberty to say who it is actually, but he's working away on it anyway, beavering away. Um, and so hopefully that'll be, there'll be a Kickstarter for that later in, in the year or possibly early next year. Exciting. So that one is um, one that, um, that's like a big fat tome. That's like a Yoon Suin equivalent. Um, so yeah, you can look forward to that. Yoon Suin itself might have a second edition as well, but um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, we're waiting and seeing. So, um, speaking of art and of Yoon Suen, that brings up Matthew Adams, who you it does. Back. He's resurrected. If he, he, up on. He, <laughs> he, if he was, he's back now uh, yeah. for, for, for the Blue Wizard. What mm. is he doing for you and what can we look forward to art-wise in your magazine? Well, he's, doing the, he's done the cover that you can see. If you go to the Kickstarter page, you'll be able to see it like, if you scroll down. And he's doing the back cover as well. Is he still um, doing pixel art? Because this looks like a combination of pixel art and his, some other style. No, it's. Um, I am reliably informed by Matt himself that it's all done on MS Paint. So, <laughs> uh. <laughs> so everything, his announced intention, I think, is to never do anything ever again unless it's in MS Paint. <laughs> So was he, there uh, any kind of sane reason for that, or was it just? I a don't stick? know. I think uh, no. I I, I I could ask him. I suppose I didn't really dig deeply into that, but I think it might be something similar to um, like almost like a kind of creative constraint kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you know, like um, if you have like a completely blank canvas, um, literally and metaphorically, <laughs> and you've got like any kind of writing implements. You can end up with like analysis, analysis paralysis and not be able to do anything at all. Mm -hmm. But if you confine yourself to, you know, 
okay, I'm only going to write in charcoal, I'm only going to write this particular subject, mm -hmm. then you can actually, you know, fairly readily do it. You, you, you don't suffer that kind of pressure of having too many choices. I think it might be an element of that. I think it's it's almost sort of like, yeah, if I just use MS Paint and work with its constraints, that will be like a foil for my creative genius. I think that might be his thought process. Even though he probably wouldn't use that phrase himself because he's quite self-effacing. But mm. um, but he is a genius. I think he's a genuine, like, um, uh, he's the best, like, OSR adjacent artist, I think. Oh, very strong praise there, David. So you must be happy well, to have... isn't he? Yeah, he's the most distinctive. Is he doing anything well, else? I mean, maybe not the most. There are other, like, distinctive people as well. But um, but the stuff he did for you in turn was amazing. And have you yeah. seen... Uh, I've put some, like, new... Um, there was some new art that he did for you in turn, second edition as well. And I put that on my blog. Um, and again, it's totally, like, sui generis. It doesn't look like anything else. It's like... Um, have a post name i guess you know what's to Google yeah I'll, I'll, I'll have a look actually give, give me a second um it might just be called you and suin art or something Hang on. um uh you and suin um yeah it's called you and suin second edition art update um and you'll be able to see it and it it looks like Have you have you found it? Have you opened it yourself? I don't um, know if you can just bring uh, it up. These very, are they black? They're like ASCI images. They're like well, uh, they well, are. And, but, so so but initially, also, but go on. You, you do they're it. They're also you. like they look like a combination of digital art and like <coughs> some Japanese ink art. They're not quite like a, they're not quite like anything I've seen before. It's true. And they so and what's amazing about them is they look like really simple. But then when you look really hard at them, they, they look very complex. Um, so yeah, I just think it's really, they look really cool. I, I, you can't really, um, there isn't like a ready visual descriptor, you know, or like a, a ready kind of verbal descriptor of them. Mm. And you can't really say they look like something anybody else has done. Um, True. Yeah, they just look really good, yeah. And also, there's maps by Tom Fitzgerald as well, which I totally um, forgot to mention. But now that it comes back to my mind, looking at the post, so Tom, the post, they look amazing. Yeah. So they um, it, with so the Unity in Second Edition is is like a revamped version of the main. So mostly kind of like the same text as the original, but with a bit of editing, mm -hmm. plus um, a load of new appendices. So like random encounter tables. Um, NPC party generator, um, all kinds of different things in the appendices. Um, so like 100 pages ish of new material on top of 12 um, adventure sites. So 12 um, kind of like mini dungeons. Mm -hmm. So Tom did the, the maps for all of the mini dungeons. So I, I, it, that is um, that again is finished in text form and partially in art form. So uh, hopefully that will be out, you know, well, so eventually. Fully into the realm of publishing now, as opposed to just the occasional <coughs> uh, print on demand. So the yeah. question I have for you is, the OSR or d, &D generally is, has this kind of irreducible polarity between being kind of free to play and imagine folk art mm -hmm. and the, like progressing through various degrees of capitalization until you reach something like Critical Role, which is basically Mm. full-on entertainment industry and neither of these two sides ever sit entirely comfortably with each other but they mm. kind of sustain both as well as well as much as they're in conflict they also help to sustain each other so mm -hmm. in moving from being a blogger to a print-on-demand publisher to a form now a publisher who has like at least work on demand employees uh, mm. do you have any thoughts about how where you're lo locating yourself in this in this kind of like matrix and uh <laughs> This matrice of like different of like uh, different competing uh, ideas of what D and D is. Um, yeah, I think. Well, I, I think that's a good question. Um, I think really what I'm 
I think if I, if you kind of if you put a gun to my head and told me to give you like to tell you my innermost desires, Patrick, <laughs> then I would tell you, <laughs> amongst other things, um, that like so if you fast forward to, to me being the age of like sixty, mm-hmm. it'd be quite nice to just like do like full time RPG publishing. At that point, once I've retired from like my real career, if you see what I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I could have like, a second life. So it, it's a question of like, um, but in order to get there, you need to like produce loads and loads and loads of stuff, don't you, to eventually get? Um, I mean, basically, the way I would, the way I see it, and I think I imagine you're kind of like on a, you've made a similar kind of um, calculation at some point, except without the real career element. But, well, yeah, but, <laughs> but I mean, like, if you produce enough things. <laughs> eventually you'll get to the point where your sales will kind of like keep you ticking over right in in, in the sense of mm-hmm. being you'll be able to live off like the long tail of all of the um there's a cat going past yeah, the long pretty- tail of all of the <laughs> all the products you've made but you, as you said long tail as well yeah so long tail yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> so if i so to, I don't want to. Kind of, I'm not going to kind of give figures like on the internet, obviously. But if I made like, let's say, fifteen Yun Suin equivalents, then I would probably be able to live reasonably well off the proceeds. <laughs> so it's a question of like, how do you get? <laughs> how do you get from like? How do you get to the that that point? Do you know what I mean? It'll mm-hmm. take a long time. But like eventually you could uh, you could do that, couldn't you? In theory, it's a space that hasn't really existed before for the individual creator publisher, or not to the same extent, mm. anyway. Yeah, that's true. How do you think the idea of individual creator publishers works with uh, originality? Because one of the things you notice about larger publishers is that mm. once they get an idea that works, naming no names, yeah. they basically have to uh, screw it into the ground and just yeah. keep basically producing things on the same basis, either from the same general aesthetic or from the same background or with the same rule set. So mm. how do you think you fit into that ecology? And do you reckon you'll survive doing it? Or do you reckon, uh, do you fear that you'll, um, I'm just describing my own emotional state. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. you'll be all right. World War Three will wipe, wipe you out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of this like conversation is like notwithstanding either world war three or some sort of disastrous like uh, mm-hmm. climate change event or the singularity suddenly emerging or like <laughs> many of the other things that um could possibly happen to destroy us um so notwithstanding any of those things um yeah but this well you're um you're a good example aren't you you're like um what's the word i'm looking for an exemplar you're, <laughs> you're like the paradigm case, Patrick. Well, <laughs> because <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> like the only thing I did in the OSR was A, survive, and B, not have that many mental breakdowns. Yeah. That literally destroyed me. <laughs> that made, that, that's not, not to make me an exemplar. And not post like 20,000 word long blog entries about how you've shit yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't done any of those things. <laughs> Uh, that must be interesting um, for you, because in the OSR there is like a, a Venn diagram of function of OSR creator and mm. low-level personality disorder to full and mental illness, yeah. and you're one of the few <laughs> on, in that Venn diagram who's almost completely outside the mental illness like. Uh, <laughs> almost, as far as you know, <laughs> almost that everyone be... else <laughs> is, is some degree exactly. inside. So, what are your uh, thoughts and feelings on watching the the uh, mental and uh, psychological evolution of those around you over the past 10 years it's a good question that is a good well I did, I, it's new i thought about a lot actually because i think um it, it's undoubtedly true isn't it that there is like a very there is um a strong connection between being very creative and very neurotic mm. i think like, it, it's very hard to deny that isn't it i think like looking at sort of <laughs> artists and <laughs> and writers and whatever <laughs> throughout the history um there does seem to be like quite a strong correlation and i think we see that in um in kind of like osr luminaries if we can call them that mm-hmm. um 
So yeah, but then, but I also wonder, do, do, is it just, is there something about role playing games that attracts neurotic people or, or people who have trouble fitting in? Yes, almost certainly, I would say. Yeah, uh, so I think there is definitely a kind of inherent bias in the, the people who are going to be reading and playing this stuff and creating it. Do you know what I mean? Those, they're, mm-hmm. they're going to be already a bit weird. I include myself in that camp. Like, um, So, so th- there's kind of like a, yeah... A bias is maybe too strong a, a term, but like a predilection <laughs> amongst amongst RPG creators to sort of being a bit, yeah, a bit on the edge socially, right? I mean, that's so. It's less true now, isn't it? Because now it's become almost like quite cool to be into D and D. Um, but it wasn't until recently. So, I feel the thought of nerd culture stuff that the ancients engines are still whirring under the surface of i don't know i don't know i yeah i, I don't I, i'm not entirely sure because i feel like there's um uh levels of uh relative integration and there's a kind of like upper class social world of like mm. corporate movers and people who appear on instagram and people who are like uh, uh of the right kind and then underneath that there's like the dark tectonics of like damaged men <laughs> <laughs> just like, screaming autistically at each other about like hit points. Like, That's not what a hit point is, Mark. We discussed this in 1965. I think, yeah, I, I don't know what to. I mean, because I'm so far out of the loop. Like, I only play D and D with like you and four other people, and we're all like, well, I was going to say we're all the same. That like, we're not, are we? Because like, oh. uh, one member of the group is like a young, um, very like, uh, I don't know. How would you describe Dave? I don't know. <laughs> one of one of these things is not like the others, but let's say most of the group are kind of like in that camp, aren't they? We're quite similar. We're quite like fusty, mm-hmm. like old farts. Oh, a lot of pipe smoke wafting through the screen. Yeah, know, maybe Ed, maybe Edmund could be described as a young fart rather than an old fart. I don't know <laughs> if he brides like that description, but so so they the, and they so they're literally like the only contact I have with. Um, real gamers is, is those people like there's five of us <laughs> so I don't really know what the truth of the matter but all I can say is in the last year or two maybe three years mm-hmm. I've independently come across three young attractive women who've all expressed <laughs> interest in D&D <laughs> you really? phrase that any more strangely but no no but that would never ever have happened before now would it like it, it, imagine in the 1990s that just that, that, that person did not exist do you mm. know what I mean a good looking young woman who was into D&D <laughs> that person didn't exist in like 1995 <laughs> I will refrain from giving a, a specific answer to that uh... you know I'm right though <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's, so. I think it's kind of like it's, it has become at least a lot less uncool than it was. And people talk about it openly now. I've got a colleague who, who, who plays it and is quite happy to to say so. Um, do, do the same colleagues know that you are a RPG? No, because no, I still live with like I, I still like <laughs> it's still my secret shame, Patrick. <laughs> As someone who grew up in the in the uh, in the eighties and the nineties. Yeah, I'm still from like the old. I'm still from the generation where you kind of, um, yeah, you keep your RPG books like hidden in the attic. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going through a lot of blank looks when I tell people what my job is and the kind of mm-hmm. like a two and a half seconds of incomprehension before they mm-hmm. just didn't hear it and carry on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just like does not compute. <laughs> but what do you tell them though? Uh, I say I write adventures for pen and paper role playing games. And if it's a long conversation, I ask them if they know what Dungeons and Dragons is or what role playing is, and I basically go from there. Yeah. Uh, and if they don't know what that is, I try and just. Yeah, that, I've had relatively a few situations where they don't have to know anything about it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and I get the same reaction every time, which is a kind of a polite, well. Yeah. <laughs> or sometimes, like, my sister's, my sister's boy likes to play those games. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, all right. Yeah. That's, yeah. They'll, like, know somebody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They'll know someone like who's an incredible nerd <laughs> who plays them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um 
yeah, but but it's definitely changing though. I do think it's definitely. I I, I just feel. I mean, you can walk into it like you know Smiths, the toy shop. Yes. I guess. Have you ever been in a Smiths? I imagine you probably haven't. But uh, I think I went in one. Unless, time. Yeah, I mean, unless you have little kids, there's, there's no real reason to go there. But um, I mean, they sell D and D books. Mm. And if you go into like Waterstones. For an American audience, when this would make much sense to you, but like Waterstones is like, like the standard kind of like bookshop chain, isn't it? I don't know what the American equivalent would be. Borders. Oh, it's borders, oh, it's like, yeah, borders. But I think they shut down. I don't know if America has any more chain bookshops. I think Amazon ate them all. Yeah, maybe. But anyway, it's it's so, and they sell like D and D books, which they I don't think they would have done back in our sort of time, back in the ancient days. But they so I, th- I think it is becoming more popular and things like Critical Role and um, what's that thing people watch on TV? Stranger Things is that like D and D related? <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> Have you ever watched an episode of Critical Role? No, I, I, I tried. I tried to watch the first episode. I, I couldn't bear it. I just couldn't. I couldn't. Like <laughs> I just couldn't bear it. <laughs> Have you? No, <laughs> me neither. I, I, I have tried to watch it, and it's not that I. Um, because uh, I had this, I had it in my head that I'd like do a review of it on the blog, oh. but then I realised if I did, I would just be like, it would just be me. <laughs> it would just be like an old man like ranting about hating something. Um, just, at no point. Like Warhammer, uh, they change something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I just thought, no, just it's better to just. I could watch about five minutes of it before I just had to turn it off. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. I think what? I would enjoy reading both the, that, that blog's post and comments below it. Yeah, yeah. I think, do you remember Will, um, oh, what's his name? Wesley Crusher, you know. Um, oh, God, Will Wheaton, yes. Will Wheaton, yeah. Um, he did one. Did you watch that one? It was I, called, I, like... No. I mean, I, I have a kind of visceral reaction to seeing his gurning face on any Yeah, head. I know, yeah. yeah. I, he's kind of like, um, what's the opposite of Will Wheaton? It's like uh, Carl Urban, if you see him in a film. The film's probably going to be good, or at least Carl Urban will be good in it. Yeah, it's like yeah. solid, masculine, <laughs> skilled. Like you see Carl Urban, you're like, all right, this guy's going to solve some problems or be interesting to look at. Yeah, uh, I mean, come on, good hands with Carl, and we'll yeah. be like, like the opposite reaction. It's just like, <laughs> oh, Jesus, yeah. like you know, if it's got him involved. It's going to be rough. I think the last thing I saw, the time I saw his face was him doing uh, stuff for Star Trek Picard. Uh, I haven't watched it. Is it for it? And he was just like, uh, I, no, I'm no, we're going to get into like angry men screaming about small stuff. <laughs> Instead of talking about stuff that we don't like, uh, I did want to ask you some things because you have an interest in art and music, which is unusual in the OSR, not because you're interested in it, but because you have an awareness of a lot of classical art and classical music that we don't mm-hmm. see very often in, mm-hmm. in genre circles. And you occasionally do info dump posts or uh, free content posts where you go into classical paintings or classical music mm-hmm. and I wanted to investigate you a little bit because that <laughs> something that was unique to you and that we, uh, was rare coming from anyone else I wanted to ask you as an example if you could name a great painting one that hopefully that people can google that I wouldn't know about that carries some kind of D&D related energy and, and tell me about it oh, It's funny you should mention that because I was just literally um I think it was yesterday or the day before I was in an art gallery in Newcastle and I saw this painting that were just I wanted to write a blog post about but I, hang on, bear with me a second I'll see if I can find it because um, it was like so sort of like d d it was, it was nuts um, bear with me a second uh Oh, it, was, it was called something like, um, oh, what was it? Hang on. You might want to cut this bit. If you've got any sort of like technical skill, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't all of this. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was this, um, uh, I'll Google this. Yeah, yeah, here we go, here we go. Here, I've got it, I've got it. Um, God, my Google skills are amazing. Um, <laughs> it's called... Um, just Google the Bard. It's, it's called the Bard. Mm-hmm. Um, Lang, the Lang Art Gallery, L A I N G, Lang Art Gallery, um, and it's a picture of like a, a 
motherfucking bard <laughs> <laughs> with like long like a big long white beard and long hair and he's like standing on this cliff um sort of oh it's a john martin oh nice. yeah a john martin yeah um I, it, it's just like it's so like um <laughs> it's just like i want to be in that game do you know what i mean um, yeah all of john martin <laughs> is like super dnd i think um yeah when he <laughs> He started doing these pictures, which are basically like this. They're all like these massive, epic, fucking yeah. uh, gigantic scenery. And there's one, maybe one guy in it who's doing mm. something kind of heroic. Yeah, and yeah, you exactly. Look, you have to look at them really closely to find them. And he yeah. started painting them, and it took him ages to paint. And no yeah. one would buy them when he exhibited them. <laughs> and then I think this Victorian industrialist came back after the place after no one would buy a painting. And he said, oh, "I'll try, I'll try some of these." And he says, "Oh, do you like my painting?" He says, "No, but my son really enjoyed them." <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, obviously, that's a D&D painter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you look at, yeah, John Mark. See, you know better than I do. There's another one in the same art gallery called, called The Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, nice. Uh, look at that. That's an incredible painting. Because it's massive. Um, and just look at it. <laughs> um. It's just like, yeah. But when you see, I mean, in the flesh, it's incredible because it's like it's bigger than you are, it's like towering over you. This picture of um, just like, oh yeah, just like destruction of a city. It looks, it looks amazing. Um, so yeah, um, that's a good example. Um, I mean, if you just go on Wikipedia actually and, and put in John Martin, you can find these amazing pictures. Um, now that you've, now that you've. Uh, <laughs> There's loads of them of destruction. What well, there's another one that's the destruction of Pompeii, which is like basically exactly the same. <laughs> um of something being destroyed. Yeah. Um he's kind of a Ridley Scott figure. It's like he, if you like sort of horror. Yeah, yeah. Um, again. It's the classic tale though, actually, because I've just um oh I know why he's there's so many paintings of his in um in the Lang Gallery because he's from uh Northumberland, yeah, he's from Hayden Bridge. Oh. But if you, it says on Wikipedia that it's the classic tale, isn't it? He's like, he was like, um, it's like Michael Bay. Do you know what I mean? Like people love that kind of thing, but like the critics hate it, don't they? Mm -hmm. Um, You can just totally imagine (laughs) and totally understand exactly the kind of person he was. It's like Stephen King as well, isn't it? Very similar kind of. Um, So yeah, people like... (laughs) If people like pictures of cities being destroyed or like bards standing on clifftops gesticulating at soldiers for some reason <laughs> or like um did find out what the bar was doing or if there was some kind of story there no I, I, no I, I didn't look at the um at the thing you know the plaque but it's basically uh-huh. he's on this massive cliff face and he's like he's got his harp and he's like going like this <laughs> and like beneath him like far beneath him there are these soldiers kind of like cowering like you can just imagine that he's just played this, like, um, you know, like bards can in D&D, they can do, like, magical songs. You can just mm-hmm. sort of imagine him, like, <laughs> reciting some kind of, like, sanity-blasting poetry at them or something. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but there's loads. I, I, <laughs> if you go to art galleries, though, you find these amazing pictures of, like, battles and stuff, because I suppose it scratches the same itch, or it scratches the same itch, for people of that time as like Warhammer and D and D scratch for people now, right? There's like mm. there is oh, a so pre twentieth yeah. century, it's like the cinema of the nineteenth century is these giant epic paintings of amazing things happening. Yeah, yeah, right. Like battles. I just love paintings of battles, especially kind of um yeah, from that kind of era, I guess like kind of like the romantic period, I suppose. Um you know, you go to your local art gallery and you will find them. There's like these pictures of like Napoleonic battle scenes, isn't there? Or there'll be like, um, um, there's another one in the Lang actually. Actually, do you know what? I'll, I'll, if, while I'm here, let's, while I've got their website open, there's another one which is um, a painting of a siege um, of like a Roman city. Um, it's amazing. Um, where is it? I think it's in that art gallery anyway. It might be in a different one. But it's... um, oh, It might be in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, actually. Hang on a second. Um, I 
Painting of Siege. Let's see. It's, oh no, I can't find it. That's going to be, that's going to annoy me. Um, but it looks amazing as well. It's kind of like um, uh, these guys who are kind of like trying to knock down um, a gate with a battering ram. Oh. And they're being shot with arrows and like boiling oils being poured at them and stuff. It's like exactly what you imagine when you when you think of that scene. Um, so yeah, if you you know you, that's the kind of thing I'm into. <laughs> uh, we'll try. I only have you for a little bit longer. Let's see. I'd like to ask you the same question, but for classical music, you name a great piece of classical music that I wouldn't already know about, which is most of them mm -hmm. that has some serious D and D energy. D and D energy. Um, well, it depends what kind of D and D energy. I think I recently posted about Russian classical music, didn't I? I think um, I really like Rachmaninoff's Vespers, which is like Russian choir music, choral music, like a male voice choir. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like, um, that sort of sounds a bit like what Rivendell should have been like, I think. I don't know if so Tolkien would have imagined it. But you know, like you know, like Tolkien's elves always like to be singing. Yes. I imagine it's been like this awful kind of like choir, like a, this kind of like terrible, like I don't know. I, I, you can't imagine it being good, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> like, uh, no, I honestly, when I imagine elves singing, I don't imagine it being good. <laughs> I imagine it being very fey and kind of like yeah, exactly, yeah, like, and really it's... annoying, yeah. And kind of trilling, yeah. And <laughs> being really superior about it, you you don't get it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it's always like, oh yes, Bilbo was to see. He'd sat there for like the last six hours listening to these albums, <laughs> ridiculous song. So, but if you go to if you listen to Ramanos Vespers, then you'll be like, oh yeah. That, if Els was singing that, like yeah, I could um, I could get behind it. <laughs> if the Elves in Rivendell were singing that, um, or like um, you can imagine it as being like. Uh, sort of like quite a good soundtrack to like a dungeon exploration of like, you know, some kind of like magnificent ancient citadel or temple or something. But it's always like, I think, it, well, for me, it seems a bit like, it seems a little bit cliched, but like Stravinsky, if you listen to any of Stravinsky's like big ballet scores, they sound ridiculously D&D, &D, like The Rite of Spring or um, what's it called? The Firebird. Or um, the one with the pop hit, what's it called again? Oh. Petrushka. <laughs> um, if you listen to them, that that's like your that's very D and D music. Because ballet is very D and D, even though people don't think it is. It's like oh why? Because most ballet is. I didn't real. I didn't know this until I had like a daughter who's into ballet, and then you have to like get interested. You have to watch these ballets on Netflix and stuff. Like most ballets, are like fantasy stories, mm -hmm. even like the Nutcracker, you know, it's like, oh yeah, there's this magician who creates like a, a living Nutcracker who wakes up in the night and they go off to some fantasy land or, um, yeah, the Firebird, it's like Russian folklore or Swan Lake. Um, they're all like, yeah, fantasy stories, pretty much like all the ones that you can think of, like all the famous ballets. Um, yeah, um, so ballet scores are quite interesting as well. I think if you if you like, if you want to imagine sort of like being in like a wizard's sinister like tower or something, then Bartok, any Bartok music, but especially is like his um, string quartets. It's really like hideous, kind of discordant, strange music that you could just imagine some archmage being really into. <laughs> it's all like... <laughs> hey, bringing us back to your daughter's ballet takes us back to the beginning. So I wanted to ask you, I'm not sure if I've asked you this before, what's your earliest, strongest, deep imaginative memory? Not one about the real, the real world, but one about the world of the imagination. <laughs> um, the earliest... I don't know which of these came first, so I'll give you two. I'm not sure which of them was the earliest one. The, the one that I can, the one that immediately sprang to mind when you mentioned that was um, when I was a kid, I had this um, 
I don't know where I got it from, but it was in this like I think it was from sort of like kids, like a magazine, like a history magazine, and it had in it a Spanish Armada, um, like chit hex battle game thing. Oh. Um, and I didn't understand how to play it or how to like. Um, yeah, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. Like, I didn't really have anyone to play it with either at the time. Um, you know, on the day that I had it, and so I just like was. Um, I, I got lost in my own world, like sort of imagining the ships fighting each other, and like the the because the I think the aim of the game was to, for the Spanish player, like you were going to get your men who were in the Netherlands, your like men men at arms or whatever they're called, over yeah. the channel so they could invade England. Um, and the English player obviously had to stop it. But I think I, I kind of got lost in my own world, sort of, and I remember like, <laughs> it's like doing it like, and I think I was only been like five or six or something. I was really young, and I remember like singing to myself. I was doing it, singing the Star Wars music, <laughs> like making these ships fight each other. And then um, I don't know how long I was doing it for. And then at some point, I just sort of looked up, and like, <laughs> my my dad was just standing in the doorway, just like watching me, just thinking like, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know how long you stood there. <laughs> and I was like lost. I had this, I was just like imagining like the ships fighting each other. The other thing I can remember was um, me and my friends, I think there were, about, I think three of us in primary school, again, must have been about six or seven, got into our heads to draw pictures of little furry men um, <laughs> fighting each other like battles. <laughs> so instead of doing whatever we were supposed to be doing in class, we were supposed to be drawing pictures of these little fuzzy men like shooting each other with harpoons <laughs> and spears, like throwing spears at each other. Um, and like blood everywhere, just like loads of blood. Um, <laughs> and that, that was, uh, yeah, I think I was about six or seven. Um, and for some reason, yeah, that, that was like what we did <laughs> in school <laughs> when we should have been learning maths or whatever. I think there's archaeological evidence of a, like a young boy writing on bark somewhere in Finland or somewhere in Russia. Mm-hmm. I don't up and it's basically him drawing stick figures with like guys hunting and <laughs> shooting each other. Yeah, exactly. It's like what <laughs> I don't know where that <coughs> that impulse has gone. Like I don't think I could imagine doing that anymore. But um there's a period I guess yeah, from the age of about seven to about eleven or twelve, where I used to really like drawing like battle scenes. And they must be terrible as well. Like they must have been really like rubbish pictures, but it was like a good way to like while away an hour, just draw a picture of people killing each other. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. Uh, that brings us close to our end. Is there anything that I haven't asked about that you wanted to bring up? Um, no, I don't think so. Although I thought as a final question, this is what I become the questioner, Patrick. Oh, no. Um, well, A, what's happening with Demon Bone Sarcophagus? And B, what's coming next? Is it Queen Mab or what, what's like the next project you're working on? All right. So, DBS, the lady who was doing our maps disappeared. A new lady is doing them and she was doing very well, but she said she's Russian. And then as she was doing them, World War Three began. So now they started, they shut, shut down banking to Russia. So, uh, okay, pay her, so we're paying her relative in a different country. <laughs> right. She's come through with a first version of most of like the more complex maps. And I'm before I was supposed to, I was going through feedback on it. Mm-hmm. As soon as those maps are done and integrated into the text, we can and we've done like the front pages and back pages. And one of the things he's doing, which is like um, some live, basically as once the maps are done and um, the various diagrams, we can go to go to print. It's just taking a while. It's driving me as mad as everybody else. But there's no point getting upset about it. It's just the way things have turned out. It's my own, partly my own poor planning and partly chance. Once that's done, I have a few things. What do I have coming up? So I think at False Machine, we're trying to go. There's a bunch of stuff from the past you want to bring out, but we also don't want to bring them up in sequence. Mm-hmm. So it will be Demon Bones because once that is in print, and as soon as it hits the printer, I'm going to start a Kickstarter for. Speak False Machine, which is a giant book of 10 years of um, blog, ten years worth of, of like blog posts, yeah, with like, which is just gigantic. Let me see, I'll grab it. Where is it? Oh, it's here. That's the test print. You can see that. 
yes. Well, you kind of you can like half see it. Yeah. Oh wow, that's massive. Yeah, it's like a bible. So that will be next, and then after that, I'm not sure what we'll do. We might try and bring out veins of the earth because a lot of people want that, and do a fossil machine version of that. And we have the second book in Broken Fire Regime, which will be Frictionless Blue Glass, which I've also been working on today. And you also have Queen Mab, which is taking its time, but will be good, I think, once finished. And I'm also working on that. So some combination of... So the next thing will be Speak Force Machine, and then either Frictionless Blue Glass or Veins of the Earth, depending on how things go. Mm. Very good. And ideally, I will be able to, uh, ideally, yes, I will be able to run continuous Kickstarter and publications. As soon as one thing gets published, I will be able to go to Kickstarter for the next. So mm-hmm. I don't, basically the only reason I haven't so far is because I don't want to have a Kickstarter open that hasn't been fulfilled and have a new one on at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair enough. I think, I think yeah, it would be uh, immoral mm-hmm. to do that, wouldn't it, I think. Uh, yeah. And we all remember individuals from back in the day who had, like, <laughs> stacks of I think unfulfilled Kickstarters, uh, mm-hmm. and, and we also had the Malazuski right, reference that Kickstarter is basically a machine for giving you mental health problems and breaking your spirit. So <laughs> just try and get one done and then get it out. Yeah, uh, right. Whole of the, yeah. the, the whole of the third blue wizard on Kickstarter. If they Google that, they'll find it. I'll try and drop some links and things in the text yeah. below. Do you want yeah. to give me a final big sell for um, people who have yet to commit? Um, a f- big sell. I'm not a hard sell kind of person. If you like, if you like the art by Matt Adams, and if you like my blog, then you'll like the zine. If you oh. don't know whether you like those things, then there's an easy solution to that, which is you can just look at them and read them <laughs> respectively <laughs> and find out. <laughs> uh. Yeah, and if you also, if you, yeah, um. It's mostly, like I say, mostly gaming material, but there is room in there for art and short fiction as well. So if you want to create space into which OSR adjacent, I'm, I'm using that phrase, OSR adjacent fiction can be published, then um, yeah, I'm making it. I'm doing it, man. So uh, fund it. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for everyone. And I'll see you soon, David. Peace. See you later. Good to speak to you.